All right, on to chapter 19. Again, just uh, chapters 19 and 21 left <clears throat> to wrap up the semester. So last time we spoke a little bit about some basic ecological principles <clears throat> related to um, living organisms in the environment. Today we're going to focus on uh, some broader level perspective uh, ecosystem concepts, populations, and communities. <clears throat> so remember, uh, populations are groups of living things that are in the same place at the same time, and they interact with each other. Remember that communities are those populations plus uh, all of the non-living parts of the environment, so the water, <clears throat> the climate, uh, soil, that kind of thing. From a management standpoint, so things that biologists are interested in are these interactions. <clears throat> They're probably the more interesting aspects of the environment, studying how living things interact with each other. Um, but also from a practical perspective, Managers have to deal with a lot of issues related to species and communities that <clears throat> involve um, groups of living things that didn't necessarily evolve together. The book talks about this example of the Asian carp. Um, unfortunately, they're all over the place now in the upper Mississippi drainage primarily, but, but also just literally everywhere in pockets. And um, what happens is when these exotic or non-native species <clears throat> can get introduced into an environment, they end up oftentimes being able to outcompete the native species. They can be more aggressive, uh, larger, more, more um, you know, able to adapt to a wide variety of conditions sometimes than the native species that have evolved in, a, in an area. And when it gets to the point that it did in the little Calumet River, um, unfortunately, the only option that biologists have in, in cases like this is to kill off the entire ecosystem. In this case, they use a chemical um, when, they, when you deal with aquatic living things called rotenone, which unfortunately doesn't just kill the, the carp in this case, but everything. Um, but... Again, unfortunately, this is the only option when you're in kind of a last resort situation like they are in, in cases like this. And so then once the ecosystem has basically been sterilized, uh, biologists then go about transplanting the native plants and animals back in from uh, nearby waterways. Again, it's, it really is an absolute last resort, but unfortunately we've had to do a lot of this kind of thing in recent decades because of either intentional or unintentionally um, re, uh, introduced non-native species, plants and animals, insects, you name it. It's one of the reasons why California has such a kind of a strict border in, in that every time you come back into California, you uh, have to go through those check stations and, um, you know, you're supposed to declare things you might have in your vehicle that could be the source of spreading some non-native insect or whatever into California. So it's kind of the frontline defense that we have that, um, you know, a lot of states don't. And I think it's, it's for the better, as much as we feel like California is overregulated at times. So, um, as you might imagine, there are biologists who specifically study populations of living things. Typically, they study what's called demographics, which <clears throat> involves everything about a population that, um, that you need to know to understand that population. Primarily, it's about numbers, you know, the, how many of something there are. Or, typically, it's about density, the number of living things in a given area. So, oftentimes, there are terms that 
people um, confuse or just interchange and, and really they, they aren't strictly interchangeable. So make sure you do know the difference between, again, density, which is the number of living things in a given area, versus the actual number or just the strict amount of a given living thing. Numbers really though, <clears throat> and the reason we don't use them as much is they don't really tell us the, the full story. If I said, you know, the density of, um, you know, deer in Shasta County is, um, you know, five deer per, per acre, that would be a density, right? Um, if I just said there are 5,000 deer in Shasta County, well, is that good or bad? It's hard to really say because it really is about how much, um, how many individuals the habitat can support, which is why we typically look at density. So again, the, the absolute number of animals isn't really important from a biological standpoint. What's really important is how many animals there are per acre or per hectare if you're in the rest of the world. Because again, that tells us really what the habitat can support, which is what we call its carrying capacity. The number of animals that a habitat can support is its carrying capacity. And again, that's, that's expressed as, as a density, not just strictly a, a raw number. So before we can then make any decisions about whether the density is too high or too low or just right, we have to <clears throat> obviously figure out how many animals there are or how many plants there are, the density of whatever living thing we're interested in studying. And so whether we're talking about plants or animals, they're basically two methods that we use to determine that. And those methods are using plots or quadrats, which is represented by this wooden square meter frame. So that, that frame is one meter by one meter, and it represents an area. Um, and then we can estimate the number of things within that area. In this case, she's tallying the number of, um, of plants, a certain species, or it could be the amount of ground that's being covered by plants. But knowing how big the area is allows her to come up with basically something equivalent to a density, how many there are in a given area. So obviously you can count how many there are, and then the quadrat defines the area. Um, another way that we tally living things is by using transects. And the transect in this case is represented by that tape measure that stretches off into the distance. Again, that transect is a, a known length, so that gives us a defined space. And then we could walk along that line and count whatever it is we're interested in counting and then use the length of that transect as the defined area or space that we can turn into an area to again give us information uh, that would relate to a density of something. So really again no matter what it is we're counting which again that's the first step we have to know how many things we have before we can make any decisions about um, you know, whether that's a good number or not enough or too many. And uh, whether it's plants or animals or insects or pretty much any living thing, we're going to use one of these two basic methods. Now, of course, there are a lot of variations on these. Not all quadrats are one square meter. They could be a tenth of a square meter or they could be a hundred square meters. It really just depends on what it is we're counting. Transects could be a few feet long or they could be a few thousand feet long or a few hundred miles long. It just depends on, again, what it is we're counting. So in my, um, my wildlife ecology class, we spend quite a bit of time 
actually collecting data, going outside in the lab and doing uh, population estimates of plants and animals using quadrants and transects. And then we, um, you know, use the formula that I'll briefly, sorry about this, back to where, uh, and then we go through the formula to actually do the calculations that give us a number, a density. But, um, you know, we don't <clears throat> have time to really get into that, which is probably going to make all you happy because it involves math. Uh, math is good, but, um, but anyway, so we're not going to have time to get into that. But I'll, I'll show you briefly one example of a formula that we do use to, to estimate how many of something there are, just so you get an idea. And of course, the book does go into it as well, so I would encourage you to, you know, carefully read through that section, and uh, you know, it's something you may be interested in for the future. Most biologists are going to do population enumeration, in other words, estimating how many of something there are. It's a standard technique that that pretty much is fundamental to biology. So again, it is important to understand it. <clears throat> Other ways we may go about um, estimating information about populations involves trapping and marking animals in such a way that we can identify them as individuals. If you um, are a hunter and, and maybe you're a duck hunter, you probably have shot a duck or a goose that had a leg band on it, right? Numbers on there tell the biologist when the bird was uh, banded so they can get basic information about how old it is. You know, if, if it was banded when it was a yearling and then it was, you know, harvested six years later, it gives them information about how long that individual has been alive. Plus, depending on where it was banded and where it was actually harvested can give it information about movement. Bands on legs, you know, doesn't provide us the world of information, but it does provide us some really important core information. We can get a lot more information by putting telemetry on animals. Uh, in the case of this deer, it's got a collar that has a battery pack. You can kind of see the, the battery pack on the throat part of the collar. And then, of course, the deer has ear tags and a color coding system on the collar as well so that you can even tell from a distance specifically which animal that is. Anytime an animal is trapped and a mark of some sort is put on it, a band or a tag, the biologists typically are going to have collected a lot of information about that animal already. They're going to weigh it, you know, determine its age as best they can, the sex, body condition, any number of things. And then when they see that animal again, they can look up the color or the number on its ear and they know when that animal was last um, processed and then they, you know, they've got the data from the previous time. So telemetry actually gives us a lot more information about movement because we can track that animal from a distance. We don't even have to see it. And especially with technology today, we have um, collars that are actually uh, built in GPS where a biologist can uh, be in their office sitting at the computer, like all of you are now, or, or even on your phone, and um, you can call up that, that individual animal, and it'll show you a plot of where that animal's gone over the course of a day, a week, a year. And you can use um, GIS, Geographic Information Systems, to put layers on there, different habitat types, water sources, whatever you want, and see exactly where that animal's going. And that gives you a pretty good idea what it's doing. If it's in an area um, during the, you know, late spring when that deer's, uh, that doe's having its fawns, you know it's in that area because it's going to be having its fawns and it's probably choosing that area because it's going to provide protection. In the winter, it might be protection from the cold winter, etc. So you can lay those map layers on there and, and get a pretty good idea why that animal is where it is. Of course, we can put tags on pretty much any kind of living thing. Fish get these tags that are just implanted just under the skin. And then they, again, come out of the body so they can be uh, 
easily read if that fish is caught in a net or by a, a sports person. Um, that tags information can then be uh, obtained and, and uh, the data can be used by the biologists. Really small animals like hummingbirds can have transmitters put on them. Pretty much any animal can be tagged in some way so you know whether or not it's already been um, caught before. And so we, we can use a process called mark and recapture where we um, f you know capture the animal, we put a mark on it. In this case, it just happens to be um, a permanent marker with an X on the belly of this deer mouse. And um, basically that allows us to let it go. And if we capture it again in a trap, we know we've already caught that animal one time. And that's important in this case when we're using a formula called the Lincoln-Peterson Index where we can use um, uh, live traps to get an estimate of, of populations. Now, this example, obviously, it's this little deer mouse. But any animal that we can trap and put a mark on and then try to trap it again, we can use this type of population estimate to um, come up with a number of these living things. And that number by itself really isn't of any value to us. Uh, kind of like I was talking about before. I have a number at one point in time and it's pretty much meaningless. What makes it meaningful is when I do this again in the future and again and again and again over time. And so then I have data to compare from one year to the next. It gives me an index, which is a relative number from year to year. The absolute number or density um, doesn't really matter. And, and honestly, we, if, even if we get a number, um, a population density in a given year, we know that's not exactly how many of those animals there are. Some of them are never going to get seen or caught. Some get caught more than they should, probably. And again, the point isn't that we have a number that we know is exactly how many animals there are. It's more about what's the number, the estimate this year, next year, what's the estimate next year. And then what that tells us is, has the population changed? Did the population grow? Did it decline? Or did it stay about the same? And that's what's really important to us as biologists. If we see trends where a population starts declining from one year to the next to the next, that should tell us something's going on. We need to go out there and figure out why this population's dropping, or if it's growing, uh, or if it's staying the same. But again, it's that trend from one year to the next that's useful, not the absolute number as much. So again, this particular formula, fairly straightforward. Where we um, use a, an estimate where the, uh, the actual population estimate, which is uppercase N, is a function of the number of animals that we capture on the first day, and then we put an X on their belly and let them go. We set our traps again the next day, check them the next morning, and then basically we find out small m, which is how many of the animals that we caught on the second day already had a mark on their belly. And then finally the total number of animals that were caught on the second day. Now, What's represented up above here is just an example of what we would call a trapping grid. These rectangles represent a small little, you know, roughly nine inch long live trap, a small little box trap. Opens up in the front, it kind of snaps in place, put bait inside of there, animal goes inside, steps on the mechanism, the door shuts behind it, and it's trapped inside of there. In this case, we just have nine traps out. We would normally use a lot more than that. 
And actually, this whole diagram is for um, the next step of this formula. So let me take a step back for a minute. Again, this formula gives us a number, a population estimate based on setting the traps, um, checking them the next morning. Again, we mark every animal that's in the traps, let it go. Set the traps again that night, check them the next morning again. And then we got these three bits of data from that information, two days of trapping. When we plug those numbers into the, the equation, we get the estimate of the population, which again is, is just a number. To make that number more meaningful, we have to estimate the density, not just the number of mice, but the density, how many there are per acre. And the way we do that is when we put these traps out, actually let me clear this, is that we, um, we put them out, and again, we're gonna use more than nine traps typically, but we put all of our traps out, and what's really important is that the spacing between any given trap is exactly the same. And we typically decide that based on looking at uh, research that's already been done. For small animals like, like these mice, the distance could be something like 30 feet, 30 feet between traps. So it'd be 30 feet between any given trap in any given direction. What that allows us to do then is if we know how far it is between every trap in this grid, we can then determine the area. In other words, the total area that this trapping grid represents. And again, um, the, the way we do this is we take the, the spacing of the traps which in this case is 30 feet. And then we square that number because again, remember it's, it's 30 feet. Also, let me clear this again. If it's 30 feet in any given direction, that means that it's basically 15 feet in either direction from the center, right? So if it's 30 feet from center to center, and it's 15 feet from the center of one trap in either direction, that means that this square is 30 feet by 30 feet, right? If the trap spacing is 30 feet in any given direction, then that means that each trap represents an area that's 30 feet squared, right? I'm trying to write with my mouse again, so that's why it looks as bad as it does. So this red box represents 30 feet squared. And then I would multiply that number by the total number of traps. In this case, again, it's only nine. It would be more than that normally. And then if you do the math, 900, right? 30 times 30 is 900 times nine is 2,700 feet squared. And so then I can convert that to acres and that would give me the number of animals in a given area, which again is, is my density. Uh, so I, I'm not gonna ask you uh, on, the, on the test to you know use this formula or uh, you know, come up with a density, but but again, the, the book talks about it, and uh, it is a very very important part of biology when you're studying populations. All right. So again, that's why I kind of took a little time to go over that. So. Remember, again, the number that we get is just an index. It's a relative number that we compare from one year on into the future. 
We'd never know exactly how many animals there are. We only have an index relative from one year to the next. Now with plants, um, it can be a little different. If you're talking about large plants like trees, you know you could literally count every single tree if you had enough time. And time is always money. So even though we normally could also um, do total population counts, like a, a, a rancher knows exactly how many head of cattle they have, right? They're large animals, they're contained in, a, in an enclosure typically. And so you can count them, they have ear tags, you know exactly how many you have. But with wild animals, you never know exactly how many you have. You only can do an estimate, a population estimate. And then again, compare that number from one year to the next. But even in the case of, um, of plants, uh, smaller plants, we still have to do estimates. And we can never count all of them because there are just too many of them. Even though the plants can't get up and run away from you like an animal can, there still are just too many of them to count all of them. It would just take too long. About the only time we ever count the total number of something is either if they're very, very large and they can't hide from us, for example, like these elephant in the middle of the screen, or more often than not, it would be if we have an endangered animal, something that is, um, is declining in numbers and it might go extinct if, if we're not careful. In that case, it really is important to know exactly, to the best of our ability, how many of them there are. Otherwise, we just do an estimate. All right, so um, a couple of factors related to populations uh, that are important to understand when we're trying to count them is their distribution, how they're spaced across a, a given landscape. There are only three ways that living things can be spaced across a landscape, and that would be by a random distribution. So just, again, you think about grab a handful of, uh, of seeds and throw them up in the air and they just kind of randomly fall to the ground. Uh, a lot of plants have random distributions because of exactly what I just said. Small seeds, they get blown by the wind, they land wherever the wind happens to drop them, and that leads to a random distribution. They also can have what's called a uniform distribution. Certain plants and, and also certain animals may have a, a distribution where they're, they're equally spaced across the landscape. In other words, uniformly across the landscape. Now, for animals like penguins, it's not always a uniform distribution. But where they do have a uniform distribution is when they are in um, breeding mode. And so their, their eggs are just kind of laid um, and they, they kind of um, lay them and they carry them around on their feet oftentimes, but they just kind of equally space themselves across the landscape so each penguin has, you know, a couple feet around it. And that's their territory, at least during the time they are uh, protecting their eggs and their young. A lot of birds that nest in big groups like penguin, egrets, heron, uh, a lot of shorebirds, um, have uniform distribution when they're in breeding mode. Each one of them just has, you know, a space around their nest that's theirs until their young are able to leave on their own. Um, if you are in this area and you drive up to Lassen, you drive, uh, when you first go in the north entrance, you drive through what's basically lodgepole pine. And lodgepole pine is a plant that has a uniform distribution. They tend to get wiped out by a fire. All of the new trees start growing at the same time. And they all tend to grow in these uniform distribution where they each have a certain amount of space around their stem. And then they grow like that until the next fire comes through. Whereas all three of these types of distribution can occur, clumped distributions tend to be far and away the most abundant type of distribution that we find with plants and animals. 
And that's typically because living things tend to be clumped because resources that they need for their survival tend to not be randomly spread or uniformly spread, but rather they tend to be clumped. So if all of the food item is in one area, where do you think the animals are going to tend to hang out in that area where the food is? If there's, um, uh, you know, a dry habitat like these elephant typically live in, <clears throat> wherever the water holes are is where the animals are going to tend to be clumped because they're going to need access to water at least every day. And so they're going to be clumped around that important resource. So that's why most living things tend to be clumped. They are clumped because they're uh, in the area wherever their most important resource is. <clears throat> so I promised there'd be no math, and, and again, you're not going to have to do anything with this data, but it is important to uh, you know, make the point that science does depend heavily on data and numbers and being able to do things with those numbers, and, and then we use that data to base decisions on. We don't just make random decisions that aren't based on anything, so we need data. And when it comes to populations, populations are all about data and numbers. Excuse me. <clears throat> so what we have here is an example of a life table. This happens to be for a, uh, an animal called a doll sheep. It's basically a bighorn sheep, but a, but a subspecies that lives way up in uh, the northern part of Alaska and, and the Yukon. And typically we've developed these life tables for species that we uh, hunt. And you can imagine that if we um, harvest animals, it's really, really important that we know to the best of our ability not only how many of those animals there are so we can determine how many we can safely harvest and not hurt the population, um, but also to have that data so that we can monitor the populations over time. And so you can also imagine that if it's an animal that's harvested, we have access to a lot of data about those animals. If we require that the hunters check those animals, biologists then can, you know, take weights and measurements and samples and DNA and they can determine the age of that animal really precisely, depending on the animal, different methods for doing that. But animal like um, ungulates, like sheep and deer and elk, <clears throat> you can actually look at the teeth and look at the amount of wear. Every year that deer's on the planet, the, the teeth are going to wear more and more. And with practice and experience, you can get pretty good at putting the deer within maybe a, a year or two. <clears throat> deer, sheep, again, all, all kind of the same. And so because you can gather so much information on an animal that's been harvested, we can put that information into these life tables that help us make decisions in the future about these animals. And so a couple of things <clears throat> that we look at here, Notice the uh, first column is the age class, and we put these in one-year age classes. And that typically terminates with the age class that is about as old as these animals can get. In this case, roughly 14 years old. Does it mean that these never live past 14? Of course not, but on average, 14 is about the end of their life expectancy. Next column is the number that are alive at any given time. And notice we start out with a thousand. Again, does that mean that there are always a thousand sheep in a population? Again, no. But we always express these kinds of data per 1,000 individuals. We do the same with humans when we're talking about birth rates or death rates. The number of births per thousand females, number of deaths per thousand individuals. It's just kind of a standard number we use for populations, whether we're talking about humans, plants, any animal. 
And so notice then based on data, now these again aren't, aren't just numbers we make up, these are numbers that come from actual populations of doll sheep. That over time this shows us how many animals are still alive within the population until we get to that end of the life expectancy. So the number alive minus the number that die give us the number alive at the next age category. So 100, 801 minus 12 is 789. 789 minus 13 is 776 and so forth. Go ahead and clear that so I don't get this any more cluttered up. That leads us then to be able to calculate the proportion that are surviving. So out of 100% or a proportion of 1, this is the proportion, or again, you could just multiply that by 100 and get the percentage, right? So basically this is showing us what percentage of the original population are alive at each of these age categories. So out of the 1,000 individuals that start off, when we get to the four to five year old category, about 76% of those individuals are still alive. Notice with the adult sheep, the, the percentage stays pretty high and it's still over 50% by the eight to nine year old category. And then it really starts dropping off quickly. As the animals get older, um, they, they just aren't going to be as healthy. And the older they get, the more potential problems or diseases or the easier it is for a predator to get to them. Uh, and then opposite of that basically is the mortality rate. So the, the, the percentage, again, if you multiply this by 100, 20%, 1%. 1% on down to the bottom, which would be 100%. Um, this is the percentage of animals that are going to die between the 0 to 1. Now, again, notice that the 0 to 1 category, the mortality rate is almost 20%. And then it's in the single digits until we get back up to 7 to 8 years old. Again, think about how vulnerable those animals are until they're a year old, when they're young. They can't defend themselves as, as well, even though the parent tries to. So a, a lot of individuals die in the first year of life. But once they've kind of reached adult size, then they, they do a pretty good job of surviving until kind of the older age factors kick in. Um, and then a couple other factors here, but um, jump to the last one, which is the life expectancy something else we use in humans. Actuarial tables, they're called for insurance purposes. If you buy life insurance, the older you are, the more expensive the life insurance is when you buy it. When you're young, you've got a lot of years still ahead of you on average, right? Notice the older this animal gets, the fewer years or months that it's expected to live. And by the time an animal's, you know, in this 8 to 9, 9 to 10 year old category, its life expectancy is only 1, 2, you know, now it's less than a year. And so the older that animal gets, the fewer years it has left. And again, that, that just kind of makes sense, hopefully. And again, we use this in humans to basically determine the, the rate for, for things like life insurance. Of course, there are other factors for humans as well. Your, you know, your whether you smoke or not, and your health, those kinds of things. But so we use all of this data then to make decisions about doll sheep with respect to hunting. Every year, biologists have to do estimates, population estimates, and they use the data in these life tables. And then basically that information helps them determine how many permits they can issue. Now, also keep in mind that just because there are a thousand permits doesn't mean that there are going to be a thousand hunters that kill a thousand doll sheep, right? There's a <clears throat> percentage success rate as well. So that's, that's factored in, in addition.
But again, we, we make biological decisions based on data, and it's really important that we have that data to work with and that we understand it, obviously. Now, always, you know, we say a picture is worth a thousand words, maybe in this case a million words, but we can transfer that survivorship data from the life tables to graphs, to figures, that tell us basically the same sort of information. And so these survivorship curves show the uh, number of individuals over time. Again, notice that there are three types of survivorships, humans and other um, animals that are longer lived, like elephants, whales, animals that live a long time tend to have a survivorship more like humans where Notice that, again, I keep jumping back and forth here so I can use my marker, um, that so the number surviving, this would be basically zero, and this would be a lot, right? Or, or all of them, let's just say like 100%, right? So notice humans that as time goes on, and so this would, again, the time would be different. For humans, it would be from zero age, you know, when they're born to maybe 100 years old. That human survivorship is really high, right? We don't have a lot of our offspring that die early on. And that survivorship stays really high until we get really much closer to the end of our normal lifespan and then mortality really kicks in. So we have, you know, 99% of our survivorship, 90, 95, 90 in that area. And then as soon as we start getting maybe up around uh, 70 plus years old, then we start having a lot higher mortality rate. So we're a type 1 survivorship. Uh, other species are a type 2. The example here are birds. Notice this is a linear relationship, meaning that the death rate, or, or the opposite of that would be the survivorship, stays pretty much constant throughout life. There isn't a higher mortality rate or a lower mortality rate. In humans, there's a very low mortality rate for much of life and then a very high mortality rate for the end of uh, the normal lifespan. In birds, the mortality rate stays the same until they get to the end of their normal lifespan. Other things like most trees, a lot of plants, even some animals have a type 3 survivorship. One thing we may know about most um, uh, plants like trees is that they make a lot of seeds. They don't just make you know one or two offspring like like humans do. They don't just typically have maybe you know six eggs like a lot of birds do. They may literally have thousands of seeds that they make every year. And that's because when they dump a thousand seeds on the forest floor, there are a lot of animals uh, that, that like eating those seeds for food. And so they basically have to try and flood the area with so many seeds that they can't all be eaten in one season. But again, because there are so many things that eat the seeds, as soon as those seeds are on the forest floor, awful lot of them get eaten within maybe the first few weeks. But then for the rest of those seeds that survive the first few weeks of life or the maybe the first uh, several months, then the mortality rate kind of slows way down. Kind of like the beginning of uh, time for humans, the mortality rate's really low. In trees, so I should say in humans, Mortality rate's really low in the beginning of life. In things like trees, the mortality rate's really low for the rest of their life until that tree um, ultimately dies of old age or from some sort of disease.
And again, this data that ends up making these survivorship curves is um, uh, data that comes from the same type of information that we see in the life tables. And either way, basically that's information that helps us make good educated decisions about managing these different types of, uh, of life. All right, so again, if we're studying population demographics, it's about how populations change over time, how population numbers grow, decrease, but basically how they change over time. So we have um, two basic ways, again, there, there are lots of exceptions, but two basic ways that populations can change over time. So again, we have um, on the y-axis, the population number or size, and on the x-axis time. And so exponential growth happens in uh, populations. And what we see here is what we call a J-curve. Looks a little bit like a letter J. And what's happening here is when a population of whatever type of life has no limit, no limits to the resources. So let's say it's a, a population of deer that we, that we um, introduce, or actually let's use something we've already talked about. Remember when we were talking about having to poison the, the river to get rid of those Asian carp? As soon as that river has been sterilized and we've given time for the poison to leave, we capture fish that are supposed to be there from other nearby bodies of water and put those fish in the river. And when those fish get introduced, they're starting out with, with almost no competitors, right? Because you've nuked the, the, uh, the river to, to nothing. When those fish first get introduced, they don't have competitors. They basically have unlimited resources. And because of that, their numbers can start growing exponentially. They can double every year, double, double, double. Now, if resources continued to be unlimited, that population growth would keep on going. The problem for those populations is that resources are never going to be unlimited for very long. It could be months, it could be even a few years or, or maybe a decade, but eventually those resources are going to start becoming limited. And so most populations actually grow like this over time. This is called an S-curve or a logistic growth curve. Sorry, my mouse ran out of space there. So the populations start growing and notice up until about this point, it's just like when there's exponential growth. The difference is when resources start becoming limited, the species starts coming up against what is called the carrying capacity of the habitat. The, the number of living things that the habitat can sustain, not, not provide for, but sustain indefinitely, and there's a big difference. So as the population gets closer to the carrying capacity, the environment's literally pushing back because resources start becoming limited. And so because that environment is pushing back, it's called environmental resistance, the population, instead of continuing to grow as an exponential factor, the population growth rate starts slowing down. And then theoretically, it would never exceed the carrying capacity because the environment's pushing back. If the environment can only support that many animals, then you would assume that there would never be more than that many animals. And that's not, not exactly the case either. What tends to be more realistic 
is that a population will grow. So let's say those fish in that river, it grows. I'm kind of condensing it here to make, make room. But the population does tend to shoot past the carrying capacity. When that happens, the resources become more limited and then the population tends to drop and it falls below the carrying capacity. But then when the population's lower, the resources can recover. More food's available, that means there are going to be more fish. And it's going to continue to do that. It's going to continue to go above and below the carrying capacity. It's never going to stay static just below there. So the logistic growth is what we would call theoretical growth. Theoretically, a population would grow and then stabilize and never exceed the carrying capacity. But in reality, again, what the population is going to do is grow. It's going to shoot past the carrying capacity. The environment's going to pull the population back. It's going to rebound and it's going to keep kind of doing this above and below the carrying capacity uh, on into the future. Now along the way the population could crash for a variety of reasons. Population could crash because of several years of drought, less food available, and then given time when the environment kind of recovers, better rain etc then the population can grow again and shoot over the carrying capacity and it could stay above here for a few years and it could crash down there um, so the population is going to vary over time it's never going to just stabilize and be a flat line it's always going to go up and down over time So again, make sure you understand the difference between exponential growth and logistic growth and the terms carrying capacity, how many living things the habitat can support. <clears throat> so here are some, some real data to illustrate the, the growth that we've just talked about. If we grow something like yeast in a, you know, a, a laboratory, in a, in a gel, the, the type of things we used in lab to grow bacterial cultures that we look at um, this week actually in lab. Um, we give those bacteria perfect conditions to grow um, and they're eventually going to show this kind of S-shaped curve. Now on that image um, notice again it's starting off really rapid growth and then it starts to kind of taper off. The only reason that it does literally stay below the carrying capacity, which is that red dotted line, remember I said populations don't generally do that. The only reason in this case it does that is because think about the conditions. You're growing bacteria in this Petri dish. Once they fill the Petri dish, they can't keep expanding unless you're in a sci-fi movie right grows out of the dish starts growing across the world but in in a laboratory the 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 yeast environment is this specific sized thing and so the yeast grow rapidly but then they just kind of can't keep expanding because their environment their little petri dish is only so big whereas a natural population in this case seals shows you the more realistic real-world kind of change. Again, the curves look really similar, um, but, but notice that after the, for the seals, after the year like what, 1992, the population starts dropping off, and then around 2000 you see kind of a, another upward trend. Those individual dots are the, are the data points for that specific year. And so there's the average, the curve is the average. Um, so in real world populations where their environment's much larger, lots of different factors affect the populations, there is that fluctuation. Years when the population's high, years when it's low. But in a laboratory, we can replicate that perfect sort of uh, 
um, S-shape growth curve. So remember I used the word or term environmental resistance, when the environment starts pushing back, when a population's growing rapidly and it's getting near the carrying capacity, the environment starts to push back to slow down the growth rate. A lot of factors come into play, but, but one of the main ones is competition, fighting for a limited resource. Competition wouldn't occur if there were unlimited resources. But again, like I said before, resources are never unlimited, at least not for very long. So competition is always going to occur and it's always going to affect populations. Two kinds of competition, two main kinds. First one is what we would call intraspecific competition. Intra refers to, um, Sorry, just noticed for some reason. Intra refers to competition among members of the same species. And so we have here in Africa, you know, a population of wildebeest or news. And so this whole population of wildebeest are in the same place at the same time. And they're all fighting for the same food sources, the same water, the, the same population of mates. And so they're still competing with each other for resources. And this kind of leads to one of the fundamental functions of natural selection, survival of the fittest. If every one of these wildebeest survived, it wouldn't really benefit the population as much as if only the very strongest wildebeest survive. And they are the strongest because they can compete against their own individuals for enough food, water, uh, mates, etc. So intraspecific competition is competition among members of the same species. little repair on the fly there. Competition though also occurs between members of different species. In this case again Africa you've got the wildebeest out there but you've also got zebra. You're going to have a whole bunch of different um, um, species of antelope and gazelle and all kinds of different animals that are all competing for at least some of the same resources. I mean, if nothing else, these animals all need water at some point, right? So when there's a water hole they're fighting over, they're all competing for uh, enough water. But a lot of them are gonna be also eating the same food resources. So you not only have these individual zebra all competing with each other to get enough food, but now those zebra are also competing with the uh, wildebeest. Reason I went to this, uh, I just noticed this zebra here. Not dead, I'm sure, just upside down, rolling around, having a good old time there. But uh, uh, again, <clears throat> for the for the species to survive, it has to be able to compete for enough resources, food, water, shelter. And again, there's going to be competition within the species, which helps drive natural selection, as well as competition among different species. The way to, to remember the difference between inter and intra specific is um, if you're in California, there's that road that goes, you know, from the Oregon border or I should say from the Mexican border all the way through California up into Oregon and up into Washington. That's uh, five, right? And what's that highway called? It's called Interstate Highway 5 or Interstate 5, right? Inter and interstate highways are, are roads that go through different states. They don't stay just in one state. 
Interstate 10 goes all the way from California to Florida. Um, so if you remember, Interstate 5 goes through different states, then maybe you'll remember inter-specific competition is competition among different species. <clears throat> A few other factors. So again, we're interested in estimating the density of living things. There are two um, groups of factors that affect the density of living things. And again, these are also the factors that are part of that environmental resistance. These are factors that push back on populations when populations are growing. There are density dependent factors, and those are factors that the more a population grows, in other words, the more individuals there are, the higher the density, right? More individuals per acre. Density dependent factors have a greater impact the more individuals there are. So they're, they're dependent on the density. And so factors like predation. If you're a population of deer in California, the more of you there are, the more likely um, or the easier it is for a predator to find you and, and eat you. So mountain lions are, are primary predators of uh, deer in California. And so when there are more deer, it's easier for a mountain lion to find one. Uh, disease as well. If you're... Um, you're, if you have kids and, you know, typically when they catch the flu or they catch a cold, it's from another kid at school, right? You spend a number of hours a day in a room with 30 or 40, 40 other people. The density of people in that room is higher than it is just out there in the world. Going to a doctor's office may think it's because people are already sick and yeah, but also it's because of, you know, you've got a bunch of people sitting in a waiting room together. It's easier for germs to be passed if there's a bunch of people all packed together compared to if there are just a few people scattered. And so it's the same with wildlife. If there is a disease in a population, it's going to spread more easily if there is a higher density of organisms in that population. Obviously, the same with competition. The more of you there are, the more you're going to be competing for those limited resources. And then even things like parasites, ticks, fleas, are going to be more abundant if there are more hosts for them to be able to feed on. So these are all factors that have a greater impact on a population of living things when that population is at a higher density. And so predation, disease, competition are all factors that push back when a population is trying to grow. And we can actually see data that, that proves this. We've got mortality rate um, over age. And in a high-density population indicated by the red, you see that mortality is a lot higher uh, in the beginning uh, half year of life. And then from about two and a half years on, mortality is higher in a population that already has a higher density of, of living things. Again, the more individuals there are, the less food is available, the, the quality of food may not be as good. So if there's a shortage, uh, individuals are, are dying because the parents don't have enough nutrition to be able to feed them high quality milk, the, the female. And of course, if we have density dependent factors, we also have those that are independent of the density. And typically these are, are abiotic factors, non-living factors like weather, individual weather events like hurricanes, tornadoes, high wind events, heavy rainfall, uh, but even some things that are caused by humans like pollution. If you're in an area and let's say it's the springtime, and you're in an area where there are lots of quail like there are here in, in the Valley of California, 
Quail are, are a species of bird that nests on the ground, right? Of course, the adults can fly, but they lay eggs in a nest on the ground. If you happen to be right in the middle of the, of the uh, egg laying season, and then you get a very, very heavy uh, wind event that may blow nests out of the trees for other birds, right? But if you get a heavy rainfall event, then basically if that ground is covered with water, um, it doesn't matter whether there's one quail per acre or a hundred quail per acre. If suddenly the, the ground is flooded, all of the eggs are gonna get lost. So again, it doesn't matter how many individuals there are, they all are gonna be impacted equally in, in a case like that. Again, other birds that typically nest up <clears throat> in trees, if there's a right in the middle of nesting season and you get a hurricane, again, it doesn't matter if there's one nest in, in uh, you know, an acre or a thousand nests in an acre, they're all going to get blown out of the tree. So it doesn't matter what the density is, they're all going to be affected. And, and again, human-caused things, maybe fires, pollution. <clears throat> again, doesn't matter how many, what the density is, they're all affected equally by it. So those would be independent factors, factors that are independent of the density. <clears throat> there are a lot of other factors that can affect <clears throat> populations. Human-caused factors like hunting, in our um, uh, human time on this planet, we have caused species to go extinct from over-harvesting them. A lot in, in, in maybe the last 200 years, but even going back to other species like the woolly mammoth, <clears throat> it's believed based on um, you know, different, different methods of gathering information that the mammoth probably went extinct for a variety of reasons. Normally, it's not just one factor. One factor may have the biggest influence, but typically it's not just one factor. The mammoths thrived during the last ice age, and as the ice age began to come to an end, their habitat just started going away, so they didn't have the same kind of environment that they did when they were thriving. But along with that was that humans were migrating from the Bering Land Bridge coming over from the Asian continent up through Alaska and southward. And they found these large animals, but these animals didn't have predators. They didn't evolve with any fear of a predator, certainly not humans. And so even though these animals are really large, we, we figured out that they were pretty easy to kill because they didn't run away from us and we could, you know, go up to them and throw a bunch of spears at them and take them down pretty easily. And so the combination of their, their environment changing and humans probably contributed as well because of how dependent we were on them for food and skins, you know, furs for, for protection from the environment. Of course, now we're also looking at individuals like this preserved baby that was found pretty much intact, trying to find ways of uh, isolating the DNA and maybe even being able to bring these back at some point in time in the future, Jurassic Park, but with mastodons or woolly mammoths uh, and not dinosaurs. couple other factors we have to look at <clears throat> to understand populations and that involves the life strategy of living things. Typically we can classify living things, animals, in this case specifically, as either being R or K species. Again, the way to keep these separate is think of R as in rapid or R as in rabbit. I always use the phrase, you know, breed like rabbits, right? make lots and lots of babies. Um, and so our species, our species that um, 
can make lots of babies, K species that are the opposite of that. So some factors that, that are typical of, of these different types of species or different categories. K species typically exist in, in what we would call a predictable environment. They're not in, in an environment that changes rapidly from season to season, year to year. Now, elephants do often live in areas that can have a wet season and a dry season, but again, we're, we're, we're talking about um, still a fairly consistent environment. They tend to have fewer babies than a, our species, one or two babies in the case of elephants, it's usually one, but to compensate for that, the, the babies tend to be much larger when they're born, and um, they either have the ability to take care of themselves pretty pretty quickly, um, or they depend on the protection of the parents. Humans would be a K species, and again, even though our babies are helpless without us, they have us, the adults that take care of them and protect them and feed them until they're old enough to take care of themselves. They also tend to not mature very rapidly. Um, again, humans and elephants reach sexual maturity after 13, 14 years. So it takes quite a while for babies to reach their um, uh, sexual maturity compared to our species, which, um, you know, might only take weeks to reach sexual maturity. K species also tend to live near their carrying capacity, you know, right around the carrying capacity, a little above, a little below. All right, so again, um, predictable environments, large but fewer young take a long time to reach sexual maturity, and they tend to be fairly stable near the carrying capacity. Whereas those R species are typically found in, in less predictable environments, environments that vary a lot more from day to day, month to month, year to year. As you might guess, um, a lot of offspring, but they tend to be small and they need some parental care for a period of time. Although, again, that parental care may only last for a week, 10 days, maybe a couple of weeks, and then they're, they're out on their own. So a lot more babies, um, they reach sexual maturity pretty rapidly. Again, mice can go from being born to making their own babies in three weeks smaller size animals in general than uh, K species. A lot of times we, we kind of think of humans as being different. I mean, we are in a lot of ways, but we're still an animal on this planet. It's interesting if we study human populations, we see the exact same factors that affect animal populations. What's interesting then is that also allows us to make predictions about the human population going forward. If you look at the population of humans that's been plotted going back to the year 1000, notice the population curve is a J curve, just like that exponential growth curve that we saw a few slides ago, right? At this point, and again, this particular uh, graph ended at about the year 2000, but our population has continued to go pretty much upward exponentially in the last two decades. Ultimately, that type of population growth can't be sustained forever. It can't be sustained for any living thing on this planet because eventually what's going to happen? What we don't see on this graph is carrying capacity which for humans is kind of tricky because we can actually change our, our carrying capacity. As soon as we started building air conditioners and growing lots of food in, in small places, we kept changing our own Earth's carrying capacity. 
you can see, let me uh, back out of here. For a long time, the Earth's carrying capacity was probably right there, right? So this is in thousands, right? So you add another three zeros on here. And so this is basically a billion, right? So there's about 500 million. Because the Earth's population of humans was pretty constant for a long time, the carrying capacity of the Earth was probably about 500 million humans. But what happened right around here, the mid-1800s or so, Industrial Revolution, right? We started making machines that did work for us which means we kind of changed our carrying capacity. So we might have moved it up to there. Then what happened since then? Better medical care, right? Instead of dying when you were 35 from some disease, now we live, you know, typically into our mid to late 70s and well beyond because of medical care. Better agriculture, better technology in general. As we continue on, we keep inventing things that, that raise the Earth's carrying capacity. Now, there are those that think we'll be able to do this forever, that it doesn't really matter how many humans there are on the planet. We'll always be able to keep raising the carrying capacity. You know, time will tell. I, I don't believe that's the case. I believe at some point the Earth's carrying capacity and it may already be exceeded. Remember what I said happens with populations. They grow, and we'll throw in the carrying capacity of something right there. When they exceed the carrying capacity, they eventually start declining because the difference between the population and the carrying capacity is too great. Not enough food, not enough water, not enough whatever. And so every living population, when it exceeds the carrying capacity by too much, it declines. After some amount of time, the carrying capacity, the environment recovers, and so then the population recovers. But populations do this. All populations on this planet do this. So the, the, the challenge is that we really should look at the human population not being able to do this forever, at some point the population is going to have to correct itself. And whether it does it now, in 10 years, in a thousand years, at some point the population is not going to be able to keep growing. We could hope, for the sake of you know humans, that at some point the population does the S-curve and we kind of hit a stable point before we exceed the carrying capacity, whatever it is. But most real populations shoot by the carrying capacity and then stabilize. So there's no reason to think the human population is going to be any different than that. So again, it's just a matter of when that happens and uh, uh, what the repercussions are. Different way of looking at that graph is, is the doubling time, right? We were, uh, in 1800, we reached the 1 billion number of humans. And then it took, a, so <clears throat> a million years of humankind it took to reach 1 billion of us. Then it only took another 130 years for that to double to 2 billion. Then it only took 30 years to add another billion to 3 billion. Then it only took half that amount of time to add another billion. Since then, the mid-70s, our population has slowed down as far as growth. It's only taken 12 years to add another billion, 12 to add another. 2012 uh, was the year that we hit 7 billion. Notice the trend is, is good in that now it's predicted that it's going to take a little bit longer to reach 8 billion, 
and then even longer interval to reach the next billion by the year 2054. So what we could see is sort of the reverse of what happened before, that it'll continue to take longer and longer for us to reach the next billion. In other words, as our population starts hitting the absolute max capacity of the Earth, the number of years it takes to double is going to slow down. And again, hopefully that means our population is going to stabilize somewhere below what the Earth can continue to support. Whether that's 9, 10, 20, some scientists think the Earth might hit 30 billion people. That's a number that scares the crap out of me if, if I would be alive, which I won't be when that happens. But um, then I think it becomes more an issue of quality versus quantity. I used to show a video called Dodging Doomsday in my environmental science class. And there's a, a, a guy at the end who had been arguing all along that, oh, you know, humans will always find a solution to whatever problem we face. Doesn't matter how many people are on the planet, we'll always be able to, you know, grow enough food and, you know, find enough resources. But then near the end he says, but I wonder if the air will still be breathable or, you know, if we'll still have as much forest or if we'll still have as much fish in the ocean. That's a big, pardon the pun, a big but to me. I mean, how much would we want to live in a place where we have to wear, you know, oxygen masks to breathe? We already kind of do in, in places, right? You typically see people in China wearing face masks because the air is so crappy over there. This summer was a terrible summer for us because of the wildfires. Those fires are natural, but not the extent that they were this year. That was strictly man-made, a man-made problem that we caused with all these fires. So yeah, we might continue to find problems to solu you know, solu solutions to problems that we come across, but, but what cost to the environment? That's really, in my mind, of course, I'm a biologist. That's the bigger issue to me. Would we want to live in a world where we don't have clean air, clean water, animals, birds, plants to enjoy? Again, we can look at any wild population. This is a, a, an actual population of reindeer on an island that were introduced in 1911, 25 reindeer. By 1937-38, there were more than 2,000 individuals on this island. And then within the next couple of years, the population crashed. So over the course of about a decade, the population crashed down to zero because there were too many deer. They overgrazed their habitat. They were limited during the winter time, you know, when the food's at its lowest point. They basically damaged the environment so much that they lowered the carrying capacity of the environment. So this was a well-studied example, real example, of a population of living things that basically grew exponentially, right, until about 1937, and then crashed. And in this case, didn't even just kind of recover and stabilize. They crashed completely and utterly down to nothing because there were way too many of them and they destroyed their environment. So again, the lesson here is that we should take this and apply it to humans as well. Don't wait until we see the problem. We should be continuing to look for solutions to, uh, to the, the human population on this planet to make sure we never reach that point. So populations, as we've been talking about, change over time. And that can be sort of on a global scale or a local scale. Again, in this case, we're, we're sort of focused on humans. Global population growth is, is simple. The rate of growth is a function of the birth minus the death that happens on the planet. If the birth rate is greater than the death rate, the population's going to increase, right? If there are more deaths than births, then the population's going to decline. And so we can use the same idea for wildlife populations. 
but we can also look at this on the local scale. So if we zoom in just to the United States or any other country, it's not only birth plus or birth rate minus death rate, but now we also have to factor in individuals entering a population and, inter and uh, individuals exiting a population. Entering is immigration, M in, and exiting a population is emigration, exit emigration. And so for the United States, not only is it births minus deaths, and the birth rate in, in countries like the United States has slowed down a lot compared to 100 years ago. But the death rate has also dropped dramatically because of better nutrition, better medicine, etc. And so one of the things that's affecting um, our local population, and again local I mean the United States, not just California, is people coming in from other countries, which is much greater right now than the emigration rate, people leaving this country to go live in other countries. So the birth rate and the death rate are having an impact, and the death rate is declining, so that tends to have the population grow. But we also tend to have more immigration than emigration, so that also um, is affecting the population's growth rate. So again, if this were wildlife populations, we could be looking at a global growth rate, say, for, for, for the entire state of California, the deer population in California globally. Or we could look at it more locally, like, you know, southwestern Shasta County. Populations going in and out of southwestern Shasta County, in addition to the birth and death rate of those deer. So the same thing would apply to, um, to wild populations whether we're looking at more of a, <clears throat> a, a big scale, not literally globally for animals necessarily, but, you know, again, maybe a whole region or a whole state compared to just a, a county maybe. We can also look at structured age diagrams, and that tells us a lot about the population. Again, this one is for humans. We have rapid growth rates where we have a lot of young individuals being born into the population. And so notice these are the age categories from, you know, basically four-year age categories up to about the average life expectancy. When you have a lot of individuals being born into a population, you're going to tend to have rapid growth. It just should go kind of common sense, right? If you have five children per um, adult female versus an average of one child per adult female, the population that has five new babies every, with every female is going to grow a lot more rapidly. But what also tends to happen in countries where there's very rapid growth is it's a very steep pyramid. The age expectancy generally isn't as high, so there's a higher mortality rate as you get near the, um, you know, mid-40s on up. More of these individuals don't live to this age. And, and the reason the, the population growth is rapid is because you're basically making a lot of babies to replace these individuals that don't tend to live as long. So that would be indicative of a rapidly growing country, um, countries in, in Africa, for example. Um, countries like China or India have the largest populations on the planet, and they're on average in these, these um, sort of rapid growth modes. Countries um, where you have slower growth, and this is kind of where the United States typically falls, are that you have um, relatively fewer children being born compared to a country like this, right? Again, you may have five, six, seven children on average compared to maybe only one child per adult female. The other thing you notice is this pyramid has got kind of uh, more gently sloping sides. 
there is a higher percentage of individuals alive at these later age categories. And even again, going beyond the 70s, a lot more individuals survive into their 70s, 80s, maybe even 90s. But it's growing slower. It doesn't have a wide base. Um, it's a more gently tapered side. Compare that with countries that actually have zero growth, where the age categories are all the same until you get to a much older um, category, right? Notice there's about the same number of individuals. The number that are born uh, and that survive stay pretty constant until you get up into, you know, 60s, 70s, and beyond. Whereas some countries actually have currently a negative growth rate. They're maybe only averaging about a half a, uh, half a child per adult, which basically means not every female is having babies, right? So they have a lot fewer babies. Um, the survival rate is high. But notice that it's actually tapering backwards. So that makes it seem like you actually have more people uh, as time goes on. And, and all that is is when these children were born 40 years prior, the growth rate was greater. Since that age category, the, the, the generations following them have had fewer and fewer babies. And so what that's going to show is that as time goes on, when this age category gets up here, it's obviously only going to be that wide. And if it keeps on that this group of kids uh, have even fewer babies, then it's even going to be a narrower pyramid. And that's why, the, why it keeps looking like it's shrinking. Because the group following you have even fewer offspring than you did. Less babies. And then those fewer babies have fewer babies. And that continues to create kind of a bottleneck at the bottom of these age pyramids. So we've been able to um, graph human populations and we can look at where a population is currently and it'll give us a predictor about where they might be in the future. Notice the, I guess I don't know why I keep going back to the other view because I end up having to backtrack anyway. Um, humans have started out in pre-industrial stage, right? We had high birth rates and high death rates, a lot of children being born, but a lot of children die um, for you know, disease, not enough food, different reasons, going back in our human time. But because, because both the birth and the death rates were high, our population stayed pretty low. As soon as human populations transition into stage two, and this basically involves having developed agriculture, so we have more reliable food sources. Um, we start getting, we started getting a, a better understanding of basic sanitation, germs, better health care. That immediately started causing the death rate to go down, more children and more people in general survived. But what didn't really change was birth rates stayed relatively high. We still depended on agriculture, so the more people in your family, the more work you can do, the more food you can provide. And so that philosophy, uh, as well as religion, played a factor in there as well to keep birth rates still pretty high. And when there's a difference between the birth rate and the death rate, if the birth rate's higher than the death rate, which is what's going on here, then the population's going to grow. Right? It goes back to that formula. The rate of increase is the difference between birth rate and death rate. 
as time goes on in populations, you start moving into stage three, the industrial stage. And now it's, it's a factor of um, more people are moving to cities. They're, they're working in industries. In other words, they're not living on farms. They're not growing their own food. So what that results in is, is the death rate continues to kind of, you know, get lower and then eventually it kind of hits a stable point because of technology, again, healthcare, nutrition, food resources, clean water, sanitation, all that stuff keeps the death rate down. But now finally, again, because we're moving into cities and we don't need eight children in a family anymore, the birth rate starts dropping. And as the birth rate gets closer to the death rate, the population finally starts stabilizing. But notice going through stage two, and until we get to the very end of stage three and actually into stage four, this is when the human population is growing rapidly. Sorry, I'm mucking that up. So as we get into stage two and as we continue into stage three, the population is growing rapidly because of the difference between the birth rate and the death rate. And it's not until the post-industrial stage, which is where the developed countries in the world are, like the United States, Japan, uh, much, of, uh, much of Europe, parts of Europe, Australia, Japan, I think I mentioned already, um, that we get into this post-industrial stage. And that means that people are better educated. People have more money. They don't tend to get married as early. Women and men are both going to college, getting careers, starting families later, maybe in their 30s. Uh, maybe even in their late 30s instead of, you know, when they're 18, 19, 20. And so instead of having larger families, maybe only one child, a lot of families don't have any children. And so because now the birth and death rates have stabilized again, the populations are going to stabilize. They've, they've hit high numbers, but they've stabilized. So there are countries like ours that are, that are over here right now where our populations have kind of stabilized. There are still a lot of places in the world, countries like Africa, Southeast Asia, India, thrown in there, parts of South America, where they're still somewhere in stage two, maybe stage three, and the populations are growing rapidly. So the countries that already have the largest populations, like India and China, are still growing at the highest rate. So the only way the world's population is going to end up over here is when the entire world kind of goes through the demographic transition into stage four. Notice as you get near the end of stage four, the population actually starts dropping because the birth rate starts dropping below the death rate, which it hasn't globally yet. But as you move through post-industrial stage four, then because mortality rate's probably going to be stable, birth rate's going to drop even more, then that allows the population to decline. And then maybe at some point hit some sort of, um, you know, more stable point globally, but not, not individually yet. It's a world map showing uh, growth rates, right? These purplish colors are basically stable, maybe even slightly negative growth. These lighter colors are uh, higher growth rates. So again, you see the developed countries like most of North America, much of Europe, some of the Norwegian countries, much of rural China, some individual countries here and there, there's Japan out there, are pretty close to a stable. Some areas have slower growth rates, purple, 
a lot of Africa um, uh, and, and, and some other areas are still growing pretty rapidly. Again, parts of Southeast Asia, these uh, islands, Indonesia, still growing very rapidly. So until the world as a whole starts going through the demographic transition, we're going to continue to have very high growth rates. So lots of information about population ecology. Very important data to, to get a handle on populations, understanding how they change over time. Some of the other factors that we'll touch on now are, are those factors that affect populations. And these are referred to as you know, community ecology factors. Things like predation and herbivory, which is basically plant predation, that turtle is still eating another living thing. So it's still technically predation, but it's herbivory because it's uh, you know eating plant material instead of eating meat are, are um, some interesting interactions to watch among living things. Maybe not a turtle eating grass so much, but um, predator-prey interactions, sharks and seals, uh, African lions and zebra are, are really interesting uh, things to watch. But again, it's these factors that play a huge role in population change over time. Ultimately, it also drives evolution. Predator-prey interactions drive natural selection, the ability of living things to adapt and survive over time. Snowshoe hare and lynx are probably one of the most studied predator-prey interactions that we've uh, looked at for a very long time. There weren't necessarily biologists back in the 1800s studying lynx and hare. But the way we got that data, the way we got population numbers on these species back then was actually in, in retroactive fashion. How might you know how many lynx or how many rabbits there were back then? Well, they both were animals that were trapped for their fur. And so we actually were able to go back and look at records of companies that bought furs. And in years when there were a lot of lynx or a lot of hair, there would have been more of them that were trapped and more of them that were sold. So again, we, we don't know exactly how many hair or lynx there were in 1845, <clears throat> but by looking at the data from trapping, we were able to get an index, a relative estimate of how many there were. And by looking at that data over decades and decades, we see trends. Again, notice there's a pretty predictable trend. About every 10 years, the population's up and then therefore down in the middle. So about every 10 years, these populations are predictable. Now again, it's not the exact same number every, every decade or, or it's not always consistent, but it's a fairly predictable pattern of about every 10 years you can you can predict the population is going to be at its high point. And so what that allows us to do out into the future is if if this is our current time right here and we do an estimate, we do a mark recapture estimate of, of the snowshoe hare and we know that's our population right now, that's going to allow us to predict that in the future, if, if, we, if we've been gathering data, you know, again, basically every year, and we see the trends going up, and then next year we see the trends going down, that tells us probably that we hit our peak this year, and that next year and next year and for five more years, our population is going to continue to cycle down until it once again cycles back up after about 10 years. So again, that allows us to make predictions or, or estimates about the future. The other thing, though, that's kind of interesting, and notice when the hair population hits its peak, we'll draw this down, I know it's red on red, but notice 
um, it takes a couple of years after the hare population hits its peak that the lynx population hits its maximum. As soon as the hare population starts declining, again, there's maybe a couple year delay and then the lynx population starts declining. The hare population starts recovering and then maybe a year or so later, the lynx population recovers. So there's this kind of lag between these two species that are dependent on each other. The lynx depends primarily on the hare for food. And of course, if that's the case, then the hare has to constantly try to not get eaten by the, by the lynx. But even though there weren't scientists out uh, this time collecting data, we've been able to gather this type of data by uh, understanding the animal and, and finding a way to, to go back and, and uh, you know, look for data. So one of the ways that, that living things try to survive, you know, which again is the only two purposes for life is to survive and reproduce, a lot of different really interesting defense mechanisms. And again, this is one of those things I'm going to say the best advice or the most interesting way to be able to study this stuff is to just watch TV, watch Animal Planet, Discovery, whatever. Because this stuff is, is um, you know, it's what some of those channels are all about. The nature programs showing you all of these just really interesting things that life does to survive. But obviously, um, uh, plants and animals had to have evolved defense mechanisms against getting eaten. So plants like foxglove on the right actually have evolved chemical defenses that produce toxins that can cause... <clears throat> all kinds of problems if something eats them. Of course, we've used foxglove to our advantage as humans. It's, um, uh, we, we've isolated a chemical called digitalis, which has been used to treat um, heart problems. Um, other plants have evolved these nasty spines and spurs to be able to just physically keep an animal from being able to eat the plant. Animals evolved coloration. If they look like the color of their environment, they can hide. If they're a prey species or if they're a predator, they can blend in so prey species uh, can't see them. And uh, so that's kind of the chameleon. It can kind of change its color pattern to a bit, to a degree, to be able to blend into its background got other animals that blend in to look like their environment in a different way. The walking stick just looks like a twig. There are bugs, uh, insects that look like leaves or that mimic other living things. And so again, if you're a predator, you can hide from a prey item. If you're a prey item, you can maybe be camouflaged and hide from a predator. One of the other things that's evolved in nature is coloration. Typically, bright colors mean danger or warning. Things have evolved bright colors, and they've evolved toxins or chemicals that either taste bad, that make their uh, something that tries to eat them sick. And so other species then, um, plants and animals, uh, evolve these colorations as a warning sign so that something won't even try to eat them if they look colorful, which could be good because there are living things that are colorful that aren't toxic or dangerous, but oftentimes they don't get eaten because they already look like they're dangerous. And so that leaves predators kind of weary of, of eating them. Mimicry is another um, evolutionary defense mechanism so you've got uh, a wasp, which is a species that has a stinger. And so something that might want to eat it or might want to bother it does so at the risk of getting stung. If you've learned over time, I don't mess with things that look like this because they sting me. Then you get species that, that by, again, evolution may have evolved a similar color pattern and 
again, it's a harmless species. This hoverfly doesn't bite, sting, or do anything nasty to protect itself. But because it kind of looks like the wasp, a lot of times um, potential predators leave it alone because they don't want to get stung in the process of trying to get a free meal. We also see this in the, the world of butterflies. There are species that, um, for a variety of reasons, are toxic or they just taste bad. The monarch butterfly is toxic because of the, the plant that it feeds on, milkweed. It actually has a latex kind of liquid in it. Um, they've evolved to be able to eat the pollen and kind of accumulate that, that toxin in their bodies, but it doesn't kill them. And so you learn over time, if you're a bird that tries to eat something that looks a certain way, that it tastes bad or makes you sick, you quit eating it. And so then that leads, again, other species to evolve similarities. They're not identical, although these two are really, really close, um, where these species um, mimic something else that has a form of protection. And so even though they're harmless, they basically don't get eaten because they look like something that is harmful if it's uh, eaten. We also look at a, um, an idea, and this is at the core of what a species is. Remember, a, a species is a unique living thing. There are no two species that are identical, which means no two species have an identical niche. They don't have identical requirements. They don't live in the same exact habitats. Two different species don't live in the exact same habitats. They don't eat the exact same food, etc. We didn't just, again, make that concept up. It was done, it was, it was developed through the process of experimental testing, testing hypotheses. And that resulted in this notion of the competitive exclusion principle. So again, we, we've, we've tested and retested this in a lot of ways, but one of the original um, sort of experiments involved these microscopic um, organisms, um, paramecium, something we looked at in lab uh, roughly last week. And so in a laboratory, if you have uh, this species of paramecium, paramecium aurelia, you let it grow in, in a laboratory and you see that it grows pretty rapidly over time, sort of that, that exponential curve until it reaches the limits of its environment. You can grow another species of paramecium,s paramecium caudatum, same thing, by itself, grows rapidly, reaches its carrying capacity. But when you put these two species together in the same place at the same time, what happens is one of those individuals, the species Aurelia, pretty much grows like it did when it was by itself, and the species caudatum starts growing and then as soon as these two species start coming in competition with each other the aurelia wins out caudatum drops off and then eventually goes extinct basically so these species because of competition are going to result in one of the species thriving and the other one being excluded so again no two species can have the exact same niche they can't have the exact same requirements. And so by definition, then, each species is a unique species. Some other interesting things that relate to the interactions between living things in an environment are symbiotic relationships. And these can go a number of different ways. Relationships where two things sort of benefit from each other. And this would be an example of something called commensalism. You have this bird, this weaver bird that makes a nest in these trees. And um, in this case, the, the bird benefits because it's got a place to put its nest. If it didn't have the, if the tree wasn't there, it wouldn't be able to build its nest in the tree. And so the bird benefits the tree doesn't really benefit in this case, but it also isn't 
harmed by that bird building in its uh, building a nest in its uh, branches. So in this case, it's a symbiotic relationship that's called commensalism. One of the organism benefits the bird in this case, the other one doesn't benefit, but it isn't harmed either. Then there are mutualistic relationships where both organisms benefit from the relationship. Termites form a mutualistic relationship with the organisms that live inside of their guts, so the microscopic organisms. Termites eat wood, right? Wood fiber, cellulose. You may remember back in the beginning of the semester we talked about cellulose and it's not readily digestible. But those little microorganisms in the gut of the termites help the uh, termite break down the cellulose. So the termite benefits by getting energy from the cellulose. The microscopic organism benefits because it also gets food from that uh, cellulose. So it's mutualistically beneficial, mutualistically beneficial to both of these living things. So it's a type of symbiosis that benefits both living things. Lichen is also a mutualistic relationship where a fungus and an algae are living together as one organism called a lichen. We'll be looking at those in lab if you're in lab as well. So they live together as one organism and each of them contribute benefits. The fungus, um, like fungi, break down dead organic matter, right? That's how they get their energy. Algae photosynthesize, that's how they get their energy. So in this case, this organism has kind of the best of both of those worlds in, in obtaining its energy. Parasites are actually um, interactions. Let me go back here just to make sure I didn't have anything else in the slide. Parasites are organisms that um, provide a relationship where the parasite itself, and this could be a, a tapeworm in this case, or a tick or a flea that might be on your uh, dog, the parasite benefits because it's got a source of food. It takes nutrients out of the body of its host. But the host doesn't necessarily benefit from this, right? So the parasite benefits, but the host doesn't. It's harmed maybe to a you know small degree, but it is harmed by this relationship. And then if you have something like a tapeworm, of course, um, it can build up enough to where the organism may be seriously harmed. Tapeworm takes all the nutrient from the gut of the host, and it could even result in a factor that combined with other factors could result in the death of the host. And so again, there are these uh, parasitic relationships that benefit the parasite, but actually do cause harm to the host. Ultimately, kind of the, I mean, I, don't, I guess it's hard to say it's the most important thing, but it's certainly one of the things that we care the most about these days is the idea of biodiversity and maintaining biodiversity on the planet, maintaining as much of the current life forms that are living on this planet as possible. We know biodiversity plays a huge role in, in the health and stability of our planet. We know that the more humans there are, the more habitat destruction, the more homes we build, the more Walmarts we build, the more roads we build, uh, has an impact on biodiversity. So it's, it's one of the primary focuses that we uh, are looking at these days and trying to find ways to not only maintain it, but maybe even build it up back to, to where it might have been in the past. Uh, and so, um, again, we've talked about how the greatest diversity are near the equators, right? 
associated with tropical rainforests. The less diversity you have, the farther you get away from the equator. And so whether we're talking about life in general or even specifically in this case, something like mammals, the number of mammals per square kilometer can approach over 200 near the equator and zero when we get far enough away from the equator. Very few, if any, species uh, can exist in really, really super extreme climates where it's ice covered the whole time. Again, when you get to areas where it literally is snow and ice covered year round, you don't have any mammal that's going to be able to exist in that kind of climate. So when I talked about how we might try to, to be able to maintain or increase biodiversity, it comes from, well, a few things. You know, we've only, the Earth is only so big. There are probably only going to be more humans on the planet tomorrow than there are today. So the more of us, the more space we take up, the less space there's going to be for, for the animals and the plants. So we have to find ways of maximizing what we have. And one of the, um, one of the ideas that came about was kind of a revolutionary idea back in the oh, 90s, I guess, maybe 80s, no, probably 90s, um, was how we look at the world. We know when we would study islands, if you have a large island, you, you're going to have more species on it, more plants and animals on it, than if you have a much smaller island. So when you look at the large Hawaiian island compared to some of the really small ones, there's more diversity and more actual numbers of living things on the big islands than the small islands. Also, when an island is close to a continent, a big body of land, it also is going to have a greater amount of species diversity than islands that are way out in the middle of the ocean. It's harder for living things to get across a big ocean to a very small island out there. So islands that are close to land are going to have greater diversity. What somebody did was start thinking about the earth, the land on the earth, the dry land on the earth has gone from like one huge island or, or you know, a bunch of islands, right? North America, South America, Asia and Europe to within the United States now or within California, we've got all these islands of habitat that are surrounded by cities or, or agricultural land or other land. And so somebody started thinking we should look at this like the land when you've got an isolated forest, it's isolated because you've got a city to the north and a bunch of agriculture to the south and the east and uh, you know maybe roads and highways and buildings and industry to the west. So you've got this forest that used to be a big forest, but because of humans, you know, cutting it down and building cities and growing food, now that big forest has become a small forest that's surrounded by other land uses. So that forest is the island in the ocean, and the ocean now is all those other land uses that are no longer forest. And so somebody looked at it and said that's just like islands out on the ocean. And so the same thing, when you have big blocks of land that are surrounded by other types of land uses, they can have greater diversity than small little fragments of forest or, or grassland or whatever that are surrounded by other types of human uses. Pieces of land that are close together, maybe there's ag land between them, but they're close, it's easier for species to go back and forth. But if those pieces of forest or whatever are far apart, and there's nothing but cities and ag and industry between them, it's a lot harder for species to make it without, you know, having getting hit by a car or, or whatever. And so we started looking at our landscape as if it were a bunch of islands. 
and it changed the way we thought about how to conserve species. And so we tried now to create bigger islands of land where we can, you know, reclaim some land, maybe revegetate it, make suitable habitat, try to make that island as big as possible. If we have islands of habitat that are not connected, you know, not, not one big land, but, but a couple of separate pieces, maybe we can't buy all the land between them to make them one big piece of land. But if we can just find a way to connect them, even if it's just a corridor, maybe there's a river going from here to here. And if we can then, you know, make that river corridor a travel route, then maybe animals can go back and forth, which makes those two small pieces of land function a little more like one bigger piece of land. Never the same as one huge piece of land, but, but a little more like it if they're at least connected. So trying to make the small fragments big or trying to connect those fragments as much as possible as a way to conserve biodiversity on the planet. And then finally, um, <clears throat> what we often do in order to try and, and preserve uh, an ecosystem or a habitat is identify the most important species in that habitat. And so we can have what are called foundation species that are literally the foundation of an environment. Coral is a foundation species because all the other plant life and therefore all the other animals in that coral reef depend on that coral being the foundation of that habitat. And so if we see a foundation species like we are with coral that's being impacted by something, we know that that's going to have an impact on all the other things in that environment. <clears throat> So then our goal is to try and preserve that foundation species because if we do, it's going to benefit so many other living things. Or on maybe a little bit smaller scale, if we can identify a keystone species within an environment. A species that would be a keystone species would be one that has a big impact on the environment. Whether or not there are a lot of them, or they're, they're, they aren't necessarily the biggest thing in the environment, but they have a huge impact on the environment. Sea stars are a keystone species in a lot of tide pools. They're, they're, they're kind of top predators. And so if, if they're healthy, if there are a lot of them, or, or, or enough of them, a, a normal amount, population of sea stars, it's telling us that all the other parts of that ecosystem are probably doing okay. If sea stars are, are abundant, that means they must have lots of food. And all those other parts of the environment that are food depend on other things for food. So it's kind of this trickle-down effect. If, um, say, a top predator is healthy and thriving, that means everything it depends on is also healthy and thriving. And so if we can take care of the sea star, then that means we actually are taking care of the entire environment. Maybe a, a little easier example to understand would be the beaver. Beaver are also a keystone species. Think about what the beaver does. Its whole purpose in life seems to be building dams, right? So it dams up small creeks and streams, and because of that, it causes the area above the dam to flood, right? So you think about a small little stream that goes through an environment. Those small streams can actually kind of dry up during the summer, right? If a beaver dams off a small stream and, and allows water to back up, now it's making a pond or maybe even a lake. And even if the rainfall stops, that lake is going to last a lot longer to the point where maybe it, it lasts until the next rainy season. So by the beaver building dams and making a more stable source of water, they're benefiting the fish, the frogs, the turtles, 
all of the other mammals. They're, they're benefiting the entire ecosystem by making a more predictable water source than that little stream might have been. So that's why beaver are also considered a keystone species. If beaver are supposed to be in the environment and there aren't a lot of them, it's telling us something is wrong with that environment. Something is not working right. If we can just get the beaver back in that environment, we're benefiting maybe thousands of other things just by taking care of that one thing. And that's really the importance of identifying keystone species because as managers, we can't do everything. But if we identify the most important thing in that environment, and then we can focus on trying to help that species recover, then by us helping one species, we may be helping dozens or hundreds or more. Last two concepts are, are succession, primary and secondary succession. Primary succession occurs when you start with bare, nothing, bare rock. No soil, just rock, which happens typically after, say, volcanic eruptions happen. There's a process that happens from, from, uh, from start to finish after you have something like a volcanic eruption. There's a couple of links here that, uh, that you can um, click on to kind of watch it. Succession is one of those things kind of like evolution that's a little bit hard to understand because it doesn't just happen overnight. It takes hundreds, thousands of years. And so it's a very slow process. Um, and so again, it's probably probably the best thing is to, to look up some information and uh, be able to watch some, uh, some actual time lapses. But primary succession, again, is when you start from bare rock. And it takes maybe dozens, if not hundreds of years to build soil. And so you go through a process of certain plants colonizing an area. We call those pioneer species. Those pioneer species kind of lay the foundation for other species to slowly take over and replace over time. And so given the hundreds, thousands of years, you have different plant communities coming and going over time. As managers, we have control somewhat over secondary succession, which is what happens when you have a community and then you have some sort of disturbance like maybe a fire. A fire may kill some or all of the vegetation, but it doesn't necessarily destroy the soil. So as long as you still have soil, not bare rock, then a plant community will, will come back quicker. And as managers, we can actually control that indirectly by the, the, um, the way we manage the vegetation. We can harvest certain things. We can use fire to change communities. But it's a process of succession, changing plant communities over time. You start with pioneer plants, again, those first ones to colonize an area after it's been disturbed. Those are replaced by intermediate species. Those are eventually replaced by what are called climax species, the ones that are sort of the, the um, it's not really the end point, but it's the mature community. That climax community then might continue on until it's disturbed again by a fire, by something else. If we're managing for a certain species that likes to be in a, an intermediate stage of succession and we're actually at a climax stage of succession, we can change that community by cutting down trees, by harvesting, by a bunch of other things to push it back to an earlier stage of succession. We can't really force it ahead because that just takes time but we can do things that kind of speed up the process a little bit. So primary succession again is when we start from bare rock um, or you know sand. Um, secondary succession is when we already have a community in place and it's changed by some type of disturbance. 
hurricane, fire, any number of things can, can affect succession. And again, this is a process that can take decades or hundreds or thousands of years to, to occur. But as managers, again, if we want to affect the species, we can tweak succession, set it back, uh, maybe do things that encourage it to move forward, but we are kind of limited on that side of things. All right. So that wraps up chapter 19. This was a little longer one than previous ones, so I wouldn't uh, hurt my feelings if you had to pause this one and take it in, uh, take it in bits. But um, remember, just one chapter remaining after this one, chapter 21, and then we are wrapping things up for the semester.